Hey, welcome back to The Power of Three. I am so happy to be with you again. And this week, we've been in 1 Corinthians. This amazing book uh, is a window into, in one sense, normal Christian community, and in another sense, to all the challenges and blessings that come with a Christian community. A generation ago, C.K. Barrett said, if you want to know the gospel, read the book of Romans. And I hope you really enjoyed the Power 3 lesson there. What an amazing encyclopedic work the book of Romans is, and the, the gospel is presented so well. He said, if you want to know the gospel, look at Romans. If you want to know how the gospel works itself out in people of all kinds and all kinds of challenges, read 1 Corinthians. And then the writer said, and by the end of 1 Corinthians, you're kind of broken, so you need 2 Corinthians to be healed. Um, 1 Corinthians is a book that is full of vitality, full of practical life lessons, and it's actually the second of four or five letters that Paul wrote over a five-year period during the 50s AD. Paul had founded the church. He had sent them a first letter kind of rebuking them for some of their moral and spiritual flaws. They hadn't quite responded, and he got rumors back that they were having all kinds of disputes, so he wrote 2 Corinthians. And then if you read a little further, I'm sorry, he wrote 1 Corinthians. If you le read a little further in 2 Corinthians, you'll find out there was a letter in between 1 and 2 Corinthians. And then 2 Corinthians is the fourth letter, and some scholars feel like the second half of that book could even be a fifth. So wow, what a long period of time. And what's stunning is Paul's the founder of the church, and yet there are people in the church that think they're more spiritual than Paul, or they have favorite other apostles and speakers that they think are more important than Paul. So Paul has to really remind them about the centrality of Jesus Christ and remind them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There are two root issues in this community. The first is disunity over which apostle they'll follow, that's the first four chapters in particular. And the second is their immaturity in some of their doctrine and their discipline. That's sort of the rest of the book climaxing in chapter 15, where people are even disputing the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ in all ages have, has wrestled with the issues presented in this book. So we're not going to make the Corinthians, you know, better or worse than anybody else, but it's a great little window on some of the challenges that we face. And Paul blends encouragement, exhortation, his insistence that we be holy people, but with confidence that he who began a good work in you will complete it. Uh, it's a wonderful thing for Paul to commend and then to convict. By the way, have you ever noticed when you're in a worship service or a prayer meeting, or maybe just a private time of prayer, that the presence of God comes with amazing comfort and conviction, sometimes in the same five-minute period? Just want you to know that's normal because God's always refining our life, trying to help us shed all that old life, help us put on the new life in Christ, and the book of Corinthians will help us do that. But our passage is going to be a way too familiar one as a centerpiece of the book. You see, throughout the chapters, Paul is having to confront immorality. He's having to confront Christians taking each other to court. He's having to confront people who think being married or being single is superior. And Paul says they're both important and they're both valid. He's having to confront issues of food sacrificed to idols. Some could eat it with no thought because those idols don't exist. Others were troubled in conscience. He even had to confront a weird sociology around communion and the weekly gathering of Christians as the rich folks were eating all the food and not regarding the poor and letting them participate. And then he had to confront spiritual gifts in chapter 12 and put them in order. So Paul's doing a lot of pastoral work but in chapter 13, he gives us a gem. He gives us some of the most important prophetic poetry we'll ever read. And yet, the, this love chapter is referred to and read so often, how many of you have heard it read at a wedding, <laughs> um, that we can sometimes forget its power and its placement. It's placed right in between all the spiritual gifts and right in between putting things in order in our worship services and in our ministries. And so as we read this, I want you to keep that context in mind. But the other thing I want us to do is realize that this agape love, the attributes of this unselfish love are first found in God. God is not asking us to love in a way that he hasn't already embraced us with. 
What an amazing thing. So I'm going to read it slowly. And with every attribute, I want you to think about how much this characterizes our wonderful Lord. Here are some key verses for our discussion and reflection together. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, by the way, it's okay to speak in tongues as we've shared from the book of Acts, but have not love, I'm a noising gong or clanging cymbal. A gift alone isn't enough. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, if I just become almost impoverished by helping poverty, or if I become a martyr, but I don't have the motive of love, then those are simply religious acts and not favored by God. If I have not love, Paul says, I'm nothing. And then he says positively, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Can I just pause here? This love is the opposite of most political discourse in our country. It's the opposite of half of the arguments that break out on social media. It's the opposite of what some leaders of both parties tend to let their insults fly toward each other. It's the opposite of that. By the way, this love is not weak or compromising. This love is holy, has convictions, but it's a completely different disposition than most of what we see in the world around us. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Oh my, how easy is it to become irritable? How easy is it to become resentful, especially when someone else advances when we think we deserve that advance? And can I make just a personal confession? It's hard sometimes when you've worked really hard for something and somebody else gets the credit, or it's hard when you feel like you've been passed over. We've all experienced it and will again. And God says, keep loving. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So when people are doing wrong, whatever that means, whether it's financial or sexual or relational, we don't rejoice in the wrong act, but we still love the people. In fact, we love them so much, we often will weep for them in prayer and plead with them to repent. So we never rejoice in sin. We rejoice in the truth. But the truth is, in Christ, God has forgiven our sins. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This love is not human passion. It's not eros. It's not mere comradeship or friendship, the Greek word storge or phileo. Uh, it is self-donating, self-sacrificing love that we see in the cross of Christ. In 1 John chapters 3, 4, and 5, the writer says, This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Here's how we know love. Jesus laid down His life for us, so also we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Wow, this agape love is the continuation of God's covenant faithfulness. The Hebrew word is hesed, his loving kindness all through the Hebrew scriptures. How has the Lord revealed his love to us recently? Have you really felt it and known it? And if not, I want you to know he's always speaking it and always there to demonstrate it to us. You know, most of our problems in life, though, arise from disordered loves, especially when our desires, even good ones, are delayed or denied. You know, our dominant culture keeps saying things, follow your passion, live a fulfilling life. And by the way, passions in order are good. God does want us to have a fulfilling life, but not on our terms, on his terms. Passions, fulfillments, desires, they were first placed there by God, but they get disordered by sin. So the, the sexual passion, which is a valid passion that God gives us and is fulfilled in marital intimacy and fidelity, that gets disordered, as you know, in all of the pornography that we face around us and all the calls to deviant sexual practices. A passion to succeed and to, to create wealth and do well in business gets disordered by greed, selfishness, and winning at all costs. A passion to know our purpose and to be fulfilled can be disordered when we forget that that fulfillment precisely comes when we shape our lives in service of God and others. But those things need to begin with God's love. And what desires and dreams do we need to yield to God today? You know, 
It's interesting when we talk about love in this way and think about the Corinthians again. They were going to court against each other. They were arguing about their favorite teacher. Um, they, the people were sleeping with the wrong people. Um, sounds a lot like normal life in, in the real world today. But when love is in order, you can make choices that require discipline. Now, it doesn't mean we always feel like it. But when we know we've been loved by God in the cross of Jesus Christ, we can then make those hard decisions to have some temporary self-denial and sacrifice for a far greater eternal end, and ultimately even that eternity stepping into time with God's blessings as we defer our fulfillment for the sake of others. What can we surrender to, to God today for forgiveness and healing? Where do we need to be more patient today and more loving? Um, by the way, sometimes healing takes time, but we can surrender it to God. You know, the Corinthians were spirit-filled, and they were exercising spiritual gifts, and Paul said, keep doing it. But these gifts are not the same thing as maturity. As you read at the beginning of chapter 3 and chapter 4, maturity consists of love and holiness and unity. It consists of making choices based on principles and not just passions or personal preferences. Where are we sometimes too quick to judge others? How can we move from immature reactions to living a more principled life? And let me reinforce something that I think is so important. Especially within our church life, we so often think our preferences are God's principles. And we need to realize the difference. So my preferences of how preaching or music or small groups or anything should be done, um, those, are, those are preferences and they're valid but they're not the first and most important thing. As I maintain the unity of the body and seek to live in holy love, I'll find my place in service, find my place in making a way for others, and find my, my way to self-donating agape love. Praise God for His grace that we can receive His love and give it away. Praise His name. <laughs>